So the city of Copenhagen, as you might know, is um, about uh, 600, 630,000 inhabitants, but in the greater region, um, about three and a half, four million, uh, because we also count the southern parts of, of Sweden as the sort of hinterland to Copenhagen. The background for the financial development of the city is actually quite a sad story. Uh, in 1994, we were put under public administration uh, from national government because Copenhagen was literally bankrupt um, uh, due to you know, mass suburbanization, uh, very sort of poor elderly community, very poor uh, tax income from the city. So we were put under national uh, administration and there was a lot of then nat national legislation and financial in initiatives to get the urban redevelopment uh, restarted. And I think that's sort of key uh, in terms of understanding the, the city and port development financial structure. So uh, Copenhagen uh, and of course the connection to southern Sweden, the city of Malmö was an important driver and sort of the first national uh, infrastructure project that was adopted was the, the Öresund bridge linking <clears throat> to Sweden and really starting this idea of a Medican Valley, um, a greater uh, Scandinavian region of financial development centered mainly around universities and uh, medicinal uh, industries. Um, and the bridge has really become an important link physically uh, as well as economically in this development. Um, national government also in, uh, invested in building out our uh, airport and making it one of the most uh, used until COVID, one of the most used uh, Scandinavian uh, international links, which for our business community, of course, was an important element as well. And the last important point in terms of traffic is the development of the metro. Uh, to say to provide sustainable mo mobility within the city. So we have the S train lines, which have been built uh, partially through the Marshall aid in the 50s and onwards, uh, which is um, this kind of finger shaped pattern going into all of the suburbs. And now we have the metro, which is the round diagram to in the bottom that uh, connects all of the inner city boroughs and the new development areas that we'll hear about later. Um, this, uh, we'll hear more about the landfill model, which is uh, maybe particular to Copenhagen, but I'd just like to stress that this is really part of our history of, of the development of the city. To the left, you see a, a diagram that illustrates in pink all of the landfill areas that have been happening since the beginning of time for Copenhagen, since the early 12th century. Um, creating new land through landfill is really sort of part of our urban heritage and we're just building on this tradition. Um, in terms of the urban history, one of the projects that really linked this, uh, this new strategy was the competition of the Ørstel uh, in, uh, in the island of Amar, closer to the airport, uh, where the first metro line came in. And uh, this was won by a Finnish company, Arki, in 1994 and became sort of the offset uh, of um, of this development model. I must say we've learned a lot of lessons also uh, through this and we're continuously um, evaluating these neighborhoods that were built in the early 90s and, and 2000s and then learning uh, upon them and, um, and uh, refining them in the newest neighborhoods that are coming up. So the link to Sweden and the link to the uh, airport was really the main selling point uh, in the beginning, so really stressing this international connection uh, and, and propelling Copenhagen out of kind of dark Scandinavia and, and linking it to the rest of Europe through this. Uh, there was also a lot of national investment in terms of moving the university to this dis district uh, and moving the um, national TV and consult hall. Um, and in the city center, um, the city the strategy for the city was to say we have the waterfront that has been for a long time been primarily industrial how can we turn the city around and reconnect to a waterfront and use this as development areas um, and then again initially a lot of national investment so new royal library new theater house new opera house a lot of cultural and institutions 
placed along the harbor that became sort of the generator for from um, from the government side in this transformation for the city all of these old industrial areas, this is uh, one of them in Islandsbrugge that used to be an old uh, um, a warehouse for and silos for, for agricultural products. Uh, there was a big explosion, these silos were, were left uh, and now they've become sort of the highlight of the urban development and the scene of the picture, the mon monocle picture of Copenhagen's transformation from an industrial city to a recreational and very, very livable city. This notion of being able to swim in the waterfront um, is, you know, very nice, but it also represents an investment of billions of kroner in terms of moving the container port, uh, moving the sewage plant, all of the excess water coming, dirty water coming into the harbor has been cleaned up. So this little symbol of being able to swim in the water is really a symbol of a lot of heavy duty investment uh, behind it. And all of the neighborhoods around the city center have been over the next 30 years then transformed into primarily housing. We've had really a push then on trying to change the housing pattern and a rule at the time in the early 90s saying that all houses had to have an average of 95 square meters or all apartments had to be 95 square meters was really the transformation piece of legislation that led to a change in the direct demographic patterns and meant that a lot of families started to stay. In terms of the existing city, uh, we had a national law in 1996 of urban renewal and initially this was very much funded by national government. Today it's almost all funded by uh, the city of Copenhagen. And over the years, uh, a lot of the existing neighborhoods have then been selected as part of the urban renewal. In white, you see the areas that uh, have already been renewed. And then in the blue, the areas that we're working with now. And, and over a five year period, this uh, represents an investment of somewhere between a half to, to one, one and a half billion uh, euros. So quite a, a large investment in these areas in terms of of um, not only developing the new areas, but also uh, making sure that the existing city comes up to the same uh, level. And this urban renewal project both has um, some quite sort of flamboyant, beautiful landmark uh, projects, a new library, cultural houses, new public spaces, but also very small sort of quality of life, everyday projects, uh, that, that are really sort of interventions in the public space. Also, what we do uh, is part of not only looking at the public space, and, and it's very seldom in a PowerPoint show, you get to see a picture of a toilet, isn't it? Uh, but um, one of the things we do in our uh, urban renewal project is also partner with private owners of uh, the building, the housing stock in Copenhagen. So uh, private owners of uh, rental flats and co-housing flats can apply the city and then have funding for 25% of renovation projects. And that's a way for us to start to uh, alter the transformation of, uh, of uh, the quality of the existing housing stock. And I must say during COVID, this has been particularly important. Um, we don't often think of the luxury of having access to your own toilet, but there's still uh, 3,000 apartments in Copenhagen that doesn't have a toilet, uh, 22,000 apartments without a bath. And during COVID, this is uh, really difficult to do social distances if you don't have uh, these opportunities. Um, our um, urban renewal housing scheme also works in terms of upgrading the energy uh, sufficiency in existing housing. So an example here, how Copenhagen has a lot of red um, brick uh, roofs. So how can we turn that into an architectural element and work with our architectural heritage while updating uh, the energy cycle of the city? Uh, the two last elements they work with are trying to say uh, we want to uh, ensure the public space, so the courtyards of all of our um, existing uh, neighborhoods. So there's a policy of each year taking a number of, of courtyards and turning them from gray to green. 
and then a large uh, public space project, which is really about tying the new neighborhoods to the old. So a lot of these public space initiatives are always placed um, between new neighborhoods uh, and the existing to try to serve as this kind of uh, melting pot um, and sort of zipper that tie them uh, together. The situation Copenhagen is now is that we are the fastest growing city uh, percentage wise uh, in Europe. Uh, we have 10,000 new inhabitants every year. We're not entirely sure what COVID means, uh, whether this will slow. Uh, but we've also seen, and maybe these graphs show, uh, some of it is in Danish, but I think you can sort of guess the pattern, that we have a very young demographic now. And the sort of increase uh, in the, our population is really young people staying in the city and having children. Uh, so the shift financially uh, has been uh, quite, uh, quite large for the city. And one of the, the things that we then try to see as a city, how can we look at these demographic changes and have an investment plan over uh, 10 and, and 50 years to look at uh, in our, all of our neighborhoods, what amount of schools do we need? What are the daycares, uh, the nursing homes, the parks, and so on? What is our investment plan looking at the projected demographic changes? And how do we work as a city sort of strategically to place these and to get the, the synergy and the quality that we want? Um, our other steering tool is uh, in terms of the new urban areas in the city saying we are only developing uh, uh, certain areas, the ones that you see in red earliest and then orange and then the pink areas uh, to have a control as a city in terms of our investments. Where do we pay for uh, new schools? Where are we building streets? Uh, how do we use our finances smartly? And very often this is linked also to the infrastructure development and, and money put into uh, metro uh, and, uh, and uh, mass transport. The last two uh, points that I'd like to mention is that uh, as so many other places in the world, we are having to deal with more extreme weather conditions. Uh, and Copenhagen had a, a very large uh, flood uh, in 2011, which meant that we developed a cloudburst management plan. And now we have 300 projects uh, all over the city. Uh, and the way we are financing them uh, is uh, mainly Everything that is underground is financed by the, um, the, uh, the water company. So it goes on the water bill every time Copenhageners drink some water. So we try to drink a lot of water and tea and coffee to support that. Um, and, but what it, and then everything that's overground is paid for us as a city. And what we're seeing is that this is really driving a lot of quality in terms of providing a new kind of public space. So more blue spaces, more green spaces, adding a lot of quality uh, in the city. And we have a, a neighborhood that's uh, called the Climate Quarter, where we are on a larger scale trying to see how can all of these initiatives, how can we learn from them and how can we use the city as a test bed to develop uh, new solutions. So this water crisis is really what's driving a lot of the public space development, 300 projects all over the city. Uh, alongside that, of course, uh, comes a green strategy. And, uh, and we have just voted to, uh, to start to build seven new parks also in the city uh, with the biodiversity strategy. And I think this tendency has just been um, uh, enforced uh, by COVID where we've seen a lack of green spaces in the city and access to green spaces. So that's a very big focus in the coming years politically. Copenhagen, as, as I mentioned, we have a problem with water and if we don't do anything, we are going to have a, a flooded medieval inner city. So this is the projection. All of the dark blue are the areas that will be flooded in a hundred years. Uh, and so um, and and uh, I think my colleagues from Pion Howe might talk more about this. Uh, our last uh, uh, very large scheme uh, investment uh, that we're looking at in terms of the financial model is how can we create water barriers? How can we protect from, uh, from the rising sea levels, both to the south of the city, which is actually where the main push from the rising seawater is. We expect one to 1 1.2 meter uh, height uh, increase in, in the seawater levels. And to the north, how can the creation of a new island, uh, landfill island, 
provide uh, new homes, new workplaces, but also function as a, a water barrier. And the financial model behind this, I'm quite sure that uh, you'll hear more from, from, uh, from Rita and Amanda in a moment. Copenhagen once was a very busy industrial and harbor industrial city. But over the years 1980s and to the middle of the 90s, it really changed in a bad manner. We couldn't compete with other cities all over Europe. We, were, uh, we didn't have the right prices, you could say. So we lost a lot of factories and businesses. They closed down, moved out of Copenhagen, moved out of, of uh, Denmark. And at the same time, people that had money, they moved out of the city. So as Camilla also uh, talked about, it was a very poor city in, in that period. And one part of, um, of, of changing that uh, was to, to start uh, is, is establishing the metro system in Copenhagen. You could say that we were very, very late compared with other cities, but at least we had that uh, decision from the national government in, in uh, 1992 to start um, building uh, this high-class uh, public transport system in Copenhagen. As you also said, we are from Uenhavn, it says in Danish, and that means in English, Copenhagen City and Port Development. It is so that we are giving the land that we are going to develop into new urban districts. We are given that land from the national government and the local government. And as we are given that for free, and we then are allowed to develop these areas into these uh, urban districts with 3 million square meters of floor area in Ørsted and 3 million square meters in Norham, the land increases in value. And that revenue from, from uh, that increasing in the value, uh, we used to transfer, to, to finance the metro construction, or we all, and we also used money to pay for local infrastructure in those uh, areas that, that we develop. We cannot wait, of course, for the land to, to have been developed. So we had to borrow loans in front and to pay for, for the metro uh, up front. And then afterwards, we pay those loans by the revenue from, from the selling of land and also for uh, rental income. So this is the organization of our company. Uh, from the start, it was owned equally uh, by the national government and, and the municipality of Copenhagen. But as all, you can say, all the big decisions in on infrastructure has been decided now. Uh, the government says, so we do not need to be part of, of, of it in, in the same way as until now. So today it's the city of Copenhagen owns 95% of uh, the company and the government only 5%. But for the government it's uh, important 5%. So they are still at the table, you could say. So when we are going to, to develop these districts, um, we start with a, a program for the character and, and uh, of, of this new district and and often we start out with we want a district with a mixed use we we discuss the district plan with the city of copenhagen and and the district plan is there uh, there too uh, and then we afterwards are responsible for the infrastructure when when we have the district plan it, when we have the master plan and then the local plan or district plan, what you would call it. And then we start uh, selling the land or we develop it ourselves. But every time we are responsible for, for all the infrastructure. We are also responsible for, for 
parking, for establishing uh, parking facilities and operating them. We have we are not allowed to build more than one parking space per each 200 square meters of floor area, and even today it's even lower. So it's not private parking, but uh, common parking houses, and that's why we establish and operating it. And then from a planning uh, perspective, as we are the planning department, we ensure the framework for, for uh, really livable and sustainable districts where people uh, like to, to live and, and to visit and to work. And often with this mix of, of houses and workplaces, but most important, I would say, uh, with blue and green areas and recreational fa facilities. The sustainable approach is very important to us, and both the economical, social, and environmental aspects. And we really are thinking a lot of people to do attractive uh, districts also on the long term. And as I already said, uh, we sell building rights to other developers. And in these years, we also use the model of co cooperating with private partners. As Metro is really in focus, it's the overall purpose of our, our development. So the first Metro line opened in 2002. And then the next one, which connects to the airport in seven. And uh, only last year, what we call the city ring that connects uh, uh, the existing city districts of the, of the existing city with each other. And we will, Amanda will tell you more about Norham. And this ring, the the, the, the first uh, line to Norham, the two stations opened. And it has also been decided that we are going to uh, do a metro line to the southern part of the harbor. So we see new decisions in more and more high class uh, uh, public transport systems that we are going to finance. And that means that it will take us a more decades before we have paid back all the loans I talked about. And uh, you kind of saw this uh, map also from, uh, from Camilla, and that is the sites, the land uh, sites and areas that we own here in Byenhaun, city and port development. Um, we thought a little bit about about the, the Northern Harbor uh, that I've marked here on the, the map. Um, it was like uh, also, uh, like Rita said, uh, to develop um, the industrial and harbor side areas. It was a really big project and it should host like, uh, the vision was to host like 4,000 inhabitants and 4,000 uh, workplaces and in total like uh, 3 million and 500 uh, square meter buildings in total. So it was in the line of to pay for the metro and all also to get the metro out to the Northern Harbour. And here you can say we have a competition in 2008 uh, and we announced uh, a, a winner of a master plan and stru structural plan for the whole area in 2009. Uh, and it was the vision it should be the sustainable city of the future. So uh, all of these elements, uh, like a city at the water and a city for everyone, the Namik city was like um, some aspects and some uh, in the program that was important for the plan that should um, incorporate it in the plan. Uh, and then, like you see in the corner, the master plan from 2009, it was the winner. Uh, and it was to have like, uh, to divide it all in uh, in ice isolates um, and have the kennels and have some green and blue areas. So uh, if you work or if you're living in Northern Harbor, you have the access to uh, green and blue areas. And also, uh, see now it's uh, like a, a round uh, loop. It was the metro station in the first um, competition, <laughs> uh, the master plan here, the structural plan. Uh, so you have like a um, high class infrastructure uh, to the Northern Harbor. And here in the corner we have from 2018, we did a 
we rewrite it and have a new plan for the area because to the, the Iceland over here, we have to, uh, to to get a new plan for that one. Um, so this is what we're working uh, for the plan for the Northern Harbour. And we have like uh, over 13 years again for the development. So it is a long-term uh, development of the Northern Harbour. Uh, and here you can see, because we are actually uh, doing some land fill and expansion in the Northern Harbour, so in the end here uh, is the is land field, is almost filled up, and it is to move the, uh, the container uh, terminal, so you have the export and import still until Copenhagen, but in the industrial side of the harbour, we have moved out to the, is the plan to move out here to the, to the end of the Northern Harbour. So we have uh, space for the development of uh, yeah, uh, workplaces and uh, houses. So here you can see all the division uh, for the Northern Harbour. And uh, now I'll just show, because we started from the, the inside, you can say the inner harbour of the Northern Harbour, and this is the first neighbourhood called Aarhuskal uh, It's not easy to pronounce, I know. Uh, but uh, it's to see um, how far we are right now, where you can see the metro station who's opened here in 2020, who in the, the spring. Uh, we have two uh, metro stations, uh, one upper and one uh, underground. And uh, it's to see here we have, uh, like uh, Rita has told, we sell the building plots uh, and then this private or public develop developer who is building the houses, uh, private or public houses, uh, and also daycare or school. Um, and then we, we uh, the city in Copenhagen for development, we uh, is doing the, the infrastructure, the urban areas. So we develop that, and then uh, we sell the, the building plots. And we are, yeah, starting here from the the inner harbor, and then we are working us out uh, to the end of, uh, of the northern harbor. So it's a really, really long term uh, development where we are working along the metro. And then there is a, a new project. It was also the same to, uh, to do a landfill of a, a whole new island uh, called the Nettehalm. And it's uh, going to work as a climate protection, uh, as Camilla uh, was saying, but it's also uh, to uh, expand the metro again and to get some. Uh, a new uh, way to to live and to work because uh, like the city of Copenhagen is, is expanded also like with 10,000 and inhabitants uh, and here you can see the expansion of the, the metro so we this is one of the the actually suggestions of the line for the metro to Lynetteholm but it's a way to show that we are expanding the, uh, the metro again uh, and that's the way that we are the developing areas to pay for the metro so um, Again, it's a, it's a very long-term uh, yeah, development where we are developing land uh, beside the, the metro. This was the, the model of uh, Copenhagen City and Port Development. Yeah, thank you for your attention.